Super Mario 64, 16 star. It's the most popular category in the most popular speed game of all time. Holding a record in it is one of gaming's toughest accomplishments. Ridiculous glitches and insane movement. Both requirements for a world record. Just a lucky few have been able to call themselves a record holder. And with the incredible level of competition, it's hard to hold on to it for long. But let's take a look at those gamers and see how they did it. This is the history of the 16-star world record. Super Mario 64 has 120 stars you can collect. There are speedrun categories that involve collecting all of them. However, the developers only required you to collect 70 of them to beat the game. That's how many you needed to make it up the endless staircase and into the final stage. For years, 70 stars was the minimum needed to beat Super Mario 64. But years after the game's release, that number suddenly dropped to 50. Eventually, it was lowered again, this time to 31. And in 2004, the number fell to just 16. Super Mario 64 could now be completed in under half an hour. And in the summer of 2004, the first 16-star speedruns of Mario 64 were performed. There were a handful of records set over the course of a few months, from players like Cyberrath and Christina Corsak. But the dust settled a bit when a runner named Illudude set a big record. In November 2004, he beat the game with 16 stars in 21 minutes and 56 seconds. And here's how he did it. The first goal in a 16-star speedrun is to collect 8 stars, which unlocks the first Bowser level, Bowser in the Dark World. He got the first star by going into bob -omb Battlefield and ground-pounding the Chain Chomp's pole three times, unlocking the star. One of the fastest ways to move in Super Mario 64 is the long jump, so Illudude chained these together over and over whenever he could. Next, he went into Womp's Fortress to collect 5 more stars. He got the first two by going to the top of the stage, defeating Womp, and then climbing to the top of the fortress. He then quickly got the star on the ledge by side flipping to it, then opened the cannon, used it to blast away the wall, and shot himself into the star to collect it. A slow process that ate up around half a minute. Finally. He got picked up by the owl to fall into the cage and collect another star. That put his total at 6 stars. The remaining two came from sliding down Peach's slide to collect both stars, despite a bit of slow movement along the way. Illudude was then able to enter Bowser in the Dark World, where he used long jumps all over to move through the stage. It took two throws to hit Bowser with a bomb, but eventually he got the job done. Now that he could go into the basement, Illudude's next goal was to collect 7 more stars to allow Mips the Rabbit to appear. The first two stars came from Shifting Sandland, where he got one from quickly jumping at the top of the pyramid, and the other from slowly waiting on top of a pillar for a bird to arrive. The next two came from Lethal Lava Land, where Illudude boiled the big bully and collected 8 red coins. His movement wasn't ideal in any of these sections, as his only real strategy for moving fast was to long jump whenever he could. Finally, the last three stars came from collecting the Toad Star 
then heading into Hazy Maze Cave, getting the Emergency Exit Star, and the Watch for Rolling Rock Star. Now, Illudude had 15 stars, which spawned Mips the Rabbit. Normally, you can just grab him for a star, but Illudude was going to use him for a trick discovered by Dom Dunk a few months prior. This was the key to beating the game with 16 stars. The first step is getting Mips through this door. By putting him down right in front of it, then going through the door, you can quickly jump back and stand inside the door. From there, you can pick up Mips, turn around, and place him on the other side. Then, you want to take Mips to this door, which you normally need 30 stars to pass through. By placing him in front of it, you can jump between Mips and the door to get pushed through it, skipping the 30 star requirement. The Mips clips could be difficult to perform, but if done properly, they would save many minutes off a Super Mario 64 speedrun. After this, Illudude went into Dire Dire Docks, collected the Submarine Star to unlock Bowser in the Fire Sea, and went through it as fast as he could. Once again, it took him two throws to defeat Bowser, but he now had the second key. It was time to head upstairs, where he was about to perform probably the most iconic trick in Super Mario 64 speedrunning, the backwards long jump. This trick was popularized in a November 2000 edition of Nintendo Power Magazine, but it's quite likely Nintendo knew about it as early as 1997, since that year, they released an updated version of Super Mario 64 in Japan that made the trick impossible. When you do a long jump but hold the stick backwards, the game gives Mario a slight boost of speed. It normally snaps back to normal quickly after, but if you land fast enough, like on stairs, it's preserved so you can do another backwards long jump. By jumping over and over, it's possible to catch Mario in a loop where his speed continuously builds up. He can keep going faster and faster. If your speed builds fast enough, it's possible to be on one side of the wall on one frame and the other side on the next. And that means if you mash correctly, you can backwards long jump and fly through doors. Illudude performed this on both the 50 star door and the endless staircase, bypassing the requirements for 50 and 70 stars respectively. Then, it was a matter of making it through Bowser in the sky and hitting Bowser with three bombs at the end. It took him six throws, but it was enough to finish with a time of 21.56, world record by a significant margin. This run was pretty good for 2004, given how new the MIPS clips and BLJs were. However, as noted before, the movement left much to be desired, and some tricks took several tries. And about six months later, a player named Kirby Carter would lower it by about a minute. He definitely did clean up the movement a bit, but was still mostly using long jumps. He didn't miss as many throws on Bowser, and was able to get the BLJs extremely quickly. However, the biggest revolution introduced in this run was the new, more reliable version of the MIPS clips. For the first one, by dropping MIPS on the seam between the door and the wall, Mario gets pushed forward and becomes stuck inside the door. The rest of the trick can be completed as before. For the second clip, it's the same process as the first clip, but instead of getting stuck in the door, Mario gets pushed through all the way to the other side. These clips were both faster and more consistent than before, becoming the clear methods to use. So, going into mid-2005, Kirby Carter's 2046 was on top. A solid record, with video proof that, from 2005, wasn't always a given. The record timeline was pretty straightforward at this point, and had followed a pattern seen by most early speedruns from the mid-2000s. Early runs recorded on VHS with primitive strategies, followed by improvements in big chunks over the following years. 
However, after this point, the 16 star history takes a bit of a turn. For the next several years, there would be two major caveats in the timeline. First, cheated or faked runs would be illegitimately on top of the leaderboard for more than 80% of the next decade. For most games, cheated runs do occasionally happen, but rarely does it affect the record timeline as substantially as it did for 16 star. So, the fastest runs from legitimate players will be included in this video instead. And second, although most runs had video proof when performed, records before 2013 have very little video surviving today, and some of the surviving stuff is very low quality. Many runs were live streamed at the time, but the videos weren't saved. There were also many emulator records at this time, but since they reduce lag and aren't kept on the same leaderboard as console runs, they won't be included in this video. It's a bit tricky to analyze runs from this period, but we'll work with what we can. After Kirby Carter's 2046, a player named LeCourer103 would rapidly lower the record down to 1908 over the course of 2005. He posted his times on the Speed Demos Archive forum, but videos for these runs seem to have never made it online. So, despite lowering the record by a minute and a half, there's not much to analyze. Then, by 2009, the record scene moved to Japan. Through August 2009, four players set a record. Sho, Shigeru, Kass, and Taka. Most of these runs don't have surviving video, and the ones that do were live streamed with 2009 levels of quality. So instead, we'll skip to December 2009, when we finally get a run with a clean video feed from Taka. Remember, Kirby Carter had gotten a 20 minute run in 2005, and there were allegedly 19 minute runs later that year. What did Taka get in 2009? How about a run clocking in at 17 minutes, 18 seconds? To put it bluntly, this record was on another level. The amount of tricks, the level of optimization, everything about Taka's run was miles ahead of runs from years prior. Truth be told, there had been many new strategies slowly implemented in runs over the years, but they all came together in Taka's record. And they started literally right when the game begins. Normally, once you reach the middle of the bridge, Lakitu stops you for a cutscene. By jumping on the very edge of the bridge railing, Taco is able to skip the trigger for the cutscene and save about 7 seconds. Once he went inside, however, the run really started to take off. This was thanks in part to a handful of major new tricks. Kirby Carter's run from 2005 was good, but Taka had some tricks up his sleeve that changed everything. Trick number 1. In bob -omb Battlefield, Taka performed the bomb clip. By activating the bomb and getting pushed by it toward the gate, you can precisely jump before it explodes, getting pushed through the gate to collect the star. This saves close to 10 seconds over the standard method. Taka then went to Womp's Fortress and performed trick number 2, a legendary one known as Cannonless. The normal process for getting the blast away the wall star is slow, and involves opening the cannon, jumping in it, shooting at the wall, and landing to collect the star. However, this can all be skipped by performing Cannonless, where you just run at the wall in the perfect spot and collect the star without blasting away the wall. It saves around 20 seconds over using the cannon, which is huge, but the issue is the precision involved. You need to hit the exact right spot in the wall for this to work, so that Mario grabs the ledge the star is on top of and his hitbox moves up to intersect with the star. Even taking time to set up the trick didn't help very much. The most skilled players struggled to hit the trick more than about 20% of the time. 16 star runs were transformed with cannonless. 
You had a couple shots to get it, but if you failed, you'd have to reset. So now, most runs wouldn't make it past the 2.5 minute mark. Thankfully, Taka hit Cannonless first try, just so he could go and perform trick number 3 immediately after. By triple jumping and wall kicking off the cage perfectly, you could fall in it without having to use the owl. It only saved around 6 seconds, but Owlless became a staple of 16 star runs as well. Another big upgrade for Taka was his movement. Older runs had just used long jumps, but Taka carefully selected his moves to optimize the speed of each section. Diving was used all over for short speed boosts, while long jumps still had their place for longer straight sections. This upgraded movement could particularly be seen in Bowser in the Dark World, where Taka varied his movement all over to collect 8 red coins for an additional star. The back half was clean too. Fast MIPS clips and BLJs helped save some additional time. However, the run definitely wasn't without its faults. He had some slip-ups, like here in Lethal Lava Land, and he missed the throw on Bowser at the very end. But thanks to the upgrades in movement, strategies, and overall execution, Taka's run was more than 3 minutes faster than the early records. Super Mario 64 speedruns were about to enter a new era. Gone were the days of infrequent records with suboptimal strategies. Over the next year and a half, the record would be broken nearly a dozen times. Most of the videos for these records didn't survive, but the few we do have show gameplay far ahead of its time. The two dominant record holders for this era were Taka and Shigeru. They took turns lowering the record into the low 17s, before Shigeru broke the sub-17 barrier with a 1654. But when Taka took the record back with a 1652, he had a trick up his sleeve. LBLJ. LBLJ stands for Lobby Backwards Long Jump, and its origins can be traced to an October 2006 video where Mr. Robert Z jumped up from below and grabbed an exposed ledge. He theorized that you could then possibly do a backwards long jump. And it turns out he was right. A tool assisted runner named Mijitsu showed it off in a TAS a month later, and it was eventually adopted by runners. By backwards long jumping into the basement ceiling, which extends upwards, you can land and repeatedly jump to build speed. You then land in a black area outside the front door with a lot of speed still built up. Then, you rotate the camera precisely to steer Mario's speed toward the 8 star door. If done properly, Mario will shoot through it and land next to the entrance for Bowser in the Dark World. This ultimately saves time because many of the 8 stars needed to open the door are slow, like ground pounding Womp three times. By ignoring the 8 star requirement, players could now just get the key right away, collect three fast stars in Womp's fortress, and head straight to the basement. It saved half a minute overall. Armed with LBLJ, Shigeru would continue to grind 16 star in 2010 and 2011. He would pull away from Taka, lowering the record deeper into the 16s, while optimizing his movement and tricks along the way. It was starting to feel inevitable that somebody would break the 16 minute barrier. But as it turns out, the first person to get a sub-16 wouldn't be Shigeru. It wouldn't be Taka, either. In fact, it wasn't anyone who had set a 16-star record before. In August 2011, someone else broke through with a 1554. And his name was Matt Turk. Nah, I'm just kidding. It was Akira. Akira's run was a culmination of strategies that had been slowly developed over the years. It started with LBLJ. He got it very cleanly, quickly rotating the camera to drop Mario in Bowser in the Dark World. After collecting 8 red coins in the key, 
He got Cannonless First Try, Owlless, and the Side Flip Star, making all three of these stars seem effortless. In Lethal Lava Land, he boiled the Big Bully, got a couple stars in the Volcano, got the Log Rolling Star via a precise triple jump wall kick, and got 8 red coins. These 5 stars were all relatively quick, the longest one taking only about 20 seconds. He then went into Shifting Sandland, got the star in the top of the pyramid, then bounced off a Sniffit to get the Bird Star early. In Hazy Maze Cave, he triple jumped to get into the Dinosaur Room quickly, then grabbed the Emergency Exit and Rolling Rock Stars. The Mips clips were about perfect, and in Dire Dire Docks, Akira went for the risky front sub to save a couple seconds. He tore through Bowser in the Fire Sea, barely making a fast cycle. Both the backwards long jumps were instantaneous, and he nailed every Bowser throw to wrap up a sub 16 minute run. This seemed like it would be the last minute barrier ever broken in 16 star. There simply wasn't enough time to save to take it past 15 minutes. That being said, there was still some room to take it lower into the 15s. About 6 months later, Batora would grab the record for the first time with a 1552, losing a bit of time to bad movement early but saving time at the end with a cleaner Bowser in the sky. Not to be outdone, Akira would beat him by a full 8 seconds in April 2013, thanks to a fast LBLJ at the start and tearing through the other BLJs. This 1544 would then stand on top of the leaderboard for the next two years. That's an incredibly long time for a category as competitive as 16 star. There were a few reasons this happened, but one really big reason is a trick about three minutes into the run. I'm talking, of course, about Cannonless. It was a pretty big blow when two thirds of your runs would die to the same trick right at the start. There wasn't a way around it. You either got Cannonless, or you reset. For years, Cannonless had been ending record runs before they could really begin. And it helped lead to stretches like this, where no world records were set for many months. If someone could just figure out a way to set it up consistently, to grab the star every time, it would open up so many new doors in 16 star. And in October 2014, that's exactly what Sockfolder did. Sockfolder is a speedrunning legend. He's found revolutionary setups for tricks in Ocarina of Time, Luigi's Mansion, even the original Super Mario Bros. Once he sets his mind to figuring something out, he's usually able to do so. This time, it was a way to solve Cannonless. On October 8th, 2014, he came out with this complicated setup. You would grab the ledge, pull yourself up, punch twice, reset the camera, walk straight down, adjust the camera, pull yourself up, backflip, punch, walk straight down again, reset the camera again, then pull yourself up and walk down. If all this was done properly, you would grab the star every single time. The obvious problem with this was how slow it was. Even if done quickly, the setup cost 10 seconds over normal cannonless. That's a significant amount of time in a run like 16 star. But luckily, later the same day, runners Def Tech and Gothic Logic would find an improvement. You didn't actually have to do the first part of the setup. You could skip straight to jumping on the ledge next to the plank, then perform the setup from there. This meant you'd only lose 6 seconds instead of 10 which was a bit more reasonable, and the whole process still lined you up perfectly to grab the ledge and collect the star. It's no exaggeration to say that Cannonless setup was one of the biggest finds in speedrunning history. Those two-thirds of runs that died at Cannonless were now gone. It now had a near 100% success rate. This gave the record so much more potential, since without having to reset as much early, players could focus on optimizing the rest of the run. So, throughout 2015, a handful of runners were gunning for the record. And what resulted was a mad dash to push the record down as much as possible.
god! Ah, oh, I love that! By May 2016, Zaya had taken the record all the way to 1524. A run with a really fast LBLJ, nearly every trick hit throughout the stages, and fast BLJs to boot. The only real noticeable slowdowns were a slow start to Pillarless and getting bad boulder luck in Hazy Maze Cave. A very impressive record given how many tricks were now in the run. And incredibly, this record too would stand for nearly two years. But eventually, a couple of new runners began to get really low times. Their personal bests dropped below 16 minutes, eventually into the 1540 range. And it became evident that both of them were going to make a push for the record. This is Aki and Ouija. In November 2017, Aki got on a run that had potential. A great LBLJ, pillarless, cannonless. After getting the second key, he was on pace for a 1525, but could potentially get as low as 1518 if he matched his best last split ever. A record by 6 seconds. It was all gonna come down to the BLJs. They were decent, but not good enough for a record. Aki would finish with a 1528, 4 seconds behind Zaya. But a few months later, he'd have another shot at it. 4 seconds ahead of his last run, he once again needed good BLJs. This time, it was good enough. A 15.22, beating Zaya by 2 seconds and making Aki the new record holder. <laughs> but a few days later, it was Ouija's turn. This was the first ever sub-1520 in 16 star history. One new trick he and Aki were using was in Womp's Fortress, where he used a new setup for Cannonless called Texture Setup that had been theorized years prior by Snowman. Instead of using Sockfolder's long setup, 
Ouija just lined up Mario's feet with a texture in the side of the plank and went for it. It wasn't as consistent as the normal setup, but it was faster, and still more consistent than no setup at all. Compromises like this had to be made now that the remaining time saves were disappearing. He gained some time over Aki with a cleaner lethal lava land, but lost some in Bowser in the Fire Sea. His BLJs were excellent, but he had a slight mistake at the end of Bowser in the Sky. Although the run had some downfalls, it was still a record by 5 seconds. Not to be outdone, Aki would fire back 6 months later with a 15-16. He messed up the triple jump in Hazy Maze Cave, and his Fire Sea had a slow ending. He made up the time over Ouija, however, with a faster MIPS grab while standing, and cleaning up his mistake in Bowser in the Sky. He also threw Bowser a bit faster each time, saving a fraction of a second per throw. At this point, when the record was lowered, it was typically only by a second or maybe a few seconds at most. When records get as precise as 16 star, where players have done tens of thousands of runs each, Taking time off in big chunks was pretty much out of the question. But incredibly, just three weeks after his 1516, Aki was in position to do just that. As always, it came down to the BLJs. No pressure. This was it, an unbelievable chance to make history. He just had to make it through Bowser in the Sky, hit all three of the throws, and he'd be golden. A 15.08 was the largest cut off the record in more than three and a half years. A near perfect run from start to finish. The mistakes in Hazy Maze Cave and Fire Sea were cleaned up and his movement overall was optimized for time saves too. As you'd expect, this run stayed at the top of the leaderboard for a long time. Six months later, it was still in first. Second place was eight seconds behind. Nobody was getting close to it. To have a realistic chance at beating this, you'd need new strats. The old ones had just about completely been optimized. As good as Aki was, it would help to change his approach if he wanted to take the record under 1508. So, as 2019 came around, he looked into what else he could do to save time. First, there was Cannonless. Texture setup was great, but it lost a few seconds over just running at the wall and praying. So, Aki decided that he needed to give up the consistency of the setup, and go back to normal cannonless. The same awful, brutal trick that killed two-thirds of all runs years prior. This was obviously a really tough move, but the run was getting so optimized that it was worth it. Second, Aki went for a faster setup for Pillarless. Developed by Tama, you would do the jump dive on the hill instead of going over the top. This enabled you to get hands-free quicker, and allow the trick to begin sooner than before. With these setups in mind, Aki kept doing attempts. On May 10th, the new time saves helped him be 6 seconds ahead of the record early. He would bleed some of this time in Fire Sea, but good BLJs kept him well ahead. Three Bowser throws later, Aki had done it again. 
。えい、ー、世界よし、じゃあ次重要行くぞ。よし、じゃあ次重要行ってやるからな。Incredibly, this record put Aki 12 seconds ahead of anyone else on the leaderboard. And he didn't stop there. He kept doing attempts for a lower record. He even had paces multiple seconds ahead of the 1504. But every time, something would kill it. But in late 2019, Aki would finally get some competition at the top of the leaderboard. And this particular runner certainly had credentials. He was both the zero star and one star record holder. He was one of the best in the world at optimizing fast movement. And his name was Dowski. Dowski had previously held the 16 star record before, getting a 15 16 the day before Aki got his incredible 1508. However, this time he wanted something more. A record that would last for a while. Even though his personal best was a few seconds behind Aki, he knew he had the skill to keep up with him. So, Dowski's record attempts began, and on November 17th, he got on a run that fell behind early thanks to missing Canalis on the first try. However, he more than made up that time with a faster fire seat. Including a different strategy at the end where he avoided jumping on the edge of the stage. He had a four second lead over the record. This actually had sub 15 potential. But as always, the BLJs stood in the way. They weren't great, but his best possible time was still one second ahead of the record. If he could tear through the stage, he'd have a chance. I don't think I got it. As it turns out, it would be record by just over a tenth of a second. For the first time in a year, Aki was no longer the record holder. With so many times being set in short succession, 16 star as a category was flourishing. There was really only one problem. At this point, it had been almost two years since someone with a funny username had set a record. In recent months, there had been Aki and Dowski, but to get a good one, you have to go back to Ouija and his 1517. And even that one's not amazing compared to the likes of 420 Blaze It and Shivering Erotic King Banana. Well, in early 2020, someone wanted to rectify that. He started moving up on the leaderboards, going from 5th to 3rd place right behind the two 1504s. And shortly thereafter, He would end up taking the top spot. And the runner's name certainly didn't disappoint. On February 27th, a 1503 was achieved by Slippery Nip. He gained time early thanks to a faster LBLJ and managed to match Dowski's speed in making the Tsukishima cycle on the platforms. In Womp's Fortress, he gained time by hitting Cannonless first try. Partially thanks to a setup by Salt and Ginger to adjust the camera and clip in the wall more consistently. He maintained this 4 second lead until the second MIPS clip, which took him two tries, but gained about a second back on the BLJs. That worked out to a 1503, just ahead of Dowski and enough to make Slippery Nip the new record holder. The community was beginning to approach a barrier. They were now just four seconds away from a sub 15 minute run. The last time a minute barrier had been broken was almost nine years prior, with Akira's 1554. Now, a run in the 14s was seeming inevitable. But what time saves were left? Well, looking at the 1503 record, the big potential time saves were the four seconds lost due to the MIPS clip. 
and a few seconds that could be saved on the BLJs. But beyond that, there were still fractions of a second to squeeze out all over. On LBLJ, Lethal Lava Land, Bowser in the Sky, all from subtle, faster strategies or improving movement. Those time saves all added up to around well under 15 minutes. But someone still had to take it there. And one player who would make a big push was Aki. After getting a 1503 of his own, Aki would get a very promising run going on May 1st, 2020. It was about even going into the MIPS clips, where he messed up the first one instead of the second one. Still, a strong Fire C and BLJs kept him just ahead going into Bowser in the Sky. And there, he was able to make a faster elevator cycle called Monomo Cycle by making his movement as tight as possible, including an incredible triple jump dive onto the platform. Three throws later, Aki was so close to a sub-15. One more second to go. Aki pushed onward over the coming days and weeks, getting great runs on pace that eventually died to something. The biggest culprit, of course, were the BLJs. Getting Mario to catch on the stairs seemed almost random at times. If you didn't get him to catch within a few jumps, it was run over, and even making it through would usually result in losing time. But Aki knew sub-15 was within reach. He just needed one good run past the BLJs. And on May 10th, 2020, Aki had this run. It was about as close to a perfect run as you could get. Chances like this don't come along very often. Now, more than ever, the BLJs needed to happen. They didn't need to be very good, he just needed something decent. Or he could get near perfect BLJs. This was his chance for the run of a lifetime. Here we go. By the skin of his teeth, Aki had pulled out a 1459, the world's first sub-15. Obviously, as good as it was, this run still had some room for improvement. He lost 6 seconds on the last split for mistakes in Bowser in the Sky. But still, that was it for big time losses. It was an incredible run up until then. And it was daunting to try and beat. For the next several months, there was little action at the top of the leaderboard. The top 3 stayed in the same spots, and 2021 came around with just Aki in the elusive Sub-15 club. See this guy down here? This is Kano, and he was 6th place in the world with a 1517. He was considered an elite runner of the game, but generally not considered a world record contender. 18 seconds was a lot of difference for a short category like 16 star, and there were several people between him and the top spot. Well, in February 2021, Kano started up a stream on Twitch and he decided that he wasn't going to end this stream until he set a 16-star world record. He wasn't going to be playing all the time, he'd still live his life and sleep on a normal schedule, but his stream would stay live the entire time. 
He knew he'd have to do some work given how far he was from the record. But Kano didn't care. He wanted to be the record holder. So he got to work. Life went on, and Kano kept streaming 16 Star. By March, his time was down to 1513. By April, it was 1507. His stream kept going. He was improving his skills and getting close to a record level. By May, he was starting to get really close, entering the top 3 with a 1503. All the while, the length of the stream climbed higher and higher going past 1,000, and then past 2,000 hours. Until finally, on June 12th, 2021, Kano had this run. He actually gained some time early thanks to a new strategy in shifting Sandland by Circlemark994, but lost a bit on MIPS from slower setups for the clips. He bled a bit more in Fire Sea from an accidental ground pound, and his BLJs weren't as clean as Aki's, but he knew the time he could save in Bowser in the Sky. After a clean stage, three throws separated him from a record. More than 3,000 hours of streaming finally put behind him. Kano went from 6th to 1st, a 1517 to a 1458. An unbelievable push that paid off in the end. And Kano could finally hit the end stream button. As the summer of 2021 went on, a few people were going for a sub 1458. One of the most notable players was Ouija. He had set a record three years prior with a 1517, but hadn't been able to replicate it. Still, he was considered a top runner. For years, he would continue lowering his personal best, staying within seconds of the record at all times. However, he never was able to take that top spot again, despite coming close on several occasions. At least, until July 4th, 2021. After 39 months, thousands of attempts, and numerous personal bests in the top 5, Ouija had finally done it again. He had beaten all the rest, and had taken back the world record. I didn't. I didn't get it. Dude, just free time. No, I didn't get it. No, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Ouija, you fool! When Ouija stopped to scroll through the text boxes, Mario was facing away from the star. All he had to do was turn around and jump into the star, but he accidentally jumped forward and lost about a second. It cost him the record. To this day, he's still trying to get it back. But that's not the last run to talk about, because in August 2021, a runner would come back to snag one final record.
So, who was the runner? Well, it wasn't Ouija, it wasn't Aki, Dowski, or Kano. There's only one username it could have been. Wow. Alright, cool. Sweet. If you enjoyed the video, I'd really appreciate if you subscribe to the channel, it really helps me out. And check out the pinned comment for links to people who helped with research and the runners in the video. Thanks.